the phone rang. That was never a good thing. I worked with teenagers, and I found out really early on teenagers no longer used phones to actually call people. If they wanted to talk to you, they were going to text you. And so every time I got a phone call, I knew it wasn't good. And as I answered the phone, his voice was shaking. And he said, she's gone. I said, who's gone? And he said, my sister. She passed away last night. Unexpectedly. There's nothing you can say in a moment like that to comfort somebody. There's nothing you can say to... to to make sense of it all. And I just said, I'll be there. And so I hung up the phone. I drove over to his house. And I just sat with him. And talked. We played video games. He looked at me about halfway, halfway through the day and he said, I need to go to school. I said, you don't need to go to school today. He said, I need to go to school. I need to pick up my books. I don't want to miss any assignments. His dad couldn't take him to school that day. Because early that afternoon, his dad had gone into work. So I took him in the car, and we drove up to his school, and we picked up his books. And on the way back, he looked at me and said, why did I want to get my books today? Why did my dad go to work? And I just looked at him and I said, I don't know. But here's one thing I do know. When trouble comes, we return to what we know. I didn't sit there and talk to him about how school for him and work for his dad was a coping mechanism and how they had just been completely overwhelmed with how their lives would be forever altered as a result of what had happened unexpectedly the night before. I didn't go through any of that with him. It wasn't the time. But it was so obvious to me as somebody who was outside of the immediacy of the situation exactly what was going on. They aren't alone in this. That's a human response. It's one of our coping mechanisms. It's what we do when things fall apart. We return to what we know. We return to what makes us comfortable. When we're hit with uncertainty, we seek that which is familiar. Jesus' friends, his disciples, his followers had just been through a whirlwind of an experience. For three years, they'd walked by Jesus. They'd traveled with him throughout the region. They had seen truly the miraculous. They had seen things that you can't, just, you can't just see and explain to somebody else. Faith has to enter the picture to describe what they had seen and what they had experienced. Jesus had told them all along that he had a greater plan, that he had a kingdom that was far greater than anything that they could fathom, but never did they anticipate that it would lead Jesus to be betrayed by one of them, to be crucified, and then three days later to rise from the dead. Never did they anticipate or expect that. And yet it happened. One of them, Thomas, as we saw last week, when he hears the, when he hears the news, when he hears the reports, he says to them, unless I reach out and I touch the wounds, I won't believe it. So Jesus appears to him and says, here you go. Take your finger and experience it for yourself. And then as John closes his gospel, which is the story of Jesus, as John closes his book, he 
he gives us yet another encounter of Jesus and his followers. And as we close walking on water today, that's what we're going to see. You can follow along on your phones or your tablets in the Bible app as we start in John 21, verse 1. If you don't have the Bible app yet on your phones or your tablets, I can't encourage you enough to download it and utilize it, but the verses will be on the screens. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, this isn't the scene of just a couple friends who have a Saturday to kill where they grab a six-pack and they head out to the shores of the lake and decide, we're going we're gonna to catch some fish today. This isn't the case of that. This is a definitive statement that he makes. Remember, the majority of the disciples, before they went and followed Jesus for three years, they were professional fishermen. When they say we're going fishing, what they mean is we're going back to the life we knew. We're going back to the life that provided us with all things stability. And we've seen some incredible things, and we've experienced some incredible things. But we are going back to a more stable existence. We are going back to something that is familiar. We're going fishing. When we, when we don't know where else to go, we return to that which is familiar. We see this all the time. It's why after you break up with somebody, when you're feeling lonely, unless you've just broken up on really bad terms and you hate that person, who do you call? You call that person. Because they're familiar. When you go to college... And it doesn't work out. And you realize, maybe this, maybe this isn't for me. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. What do you do? You return home. When you venture out and you start a new business and it doesn't succeed, it doesn't take off in the way that you thought it would, what do you do? You go back to a more stable industry that you've spent more of your career in. You return to the familiar. It's just a human reaction. And that's where the disciples are. They are completely uncertain about their future. Yes, they now have seen that Jesus was victorious over death and he rose again. But there are some things going on that they don't understand. And Jesus somehow is just appearing through walls and it's getting really weird. And these guys are fishermen and they're like, forget it. Let's get on a boat and let's go fish. Let's just go back to the life we knew. So Peter says, I'm going. And the other disciples say, we're coming too. We're going fishing. And just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. Now, if you've gone fishing, you know the only thing worse than going fishing and not catching any fish is having to tell people that you went fishing and you caught no fish. There is a reason that every time you ask somebody about the fish they caught, their arms get a little bit bigger out. Every, it's, it's just, it's a contest, all right? I don't... I don't know if this happens with women or not, or if it's just strictly a, a masculine thing, but nobody wants to admit that somebody caught a fish that was bigger than them, and so you never want to have to admit that you went fishing and you're coming back with an empty boat, especially if you're a professional. This is your livelihood. This is how you feed yourself. This is how you feed your family. And you've been out and you've caught absolutely nothing. And I love what Jesus does here. I just It's savage and it's brilliant, all wrapped into one. I mean, this is the original how's that working out for you question. I mean, it's just, it's great. 
Here, here are the guys he has spent three years pouring into and saying, ah, you're, going, you're going to do incredible things for the kingdom. Follow me, follow me. You, you have a new purpose. Remember when Jesus called a lot of these men, what did he say to them? No longer will you go out and you'll fish in the way that you've always gone out fishing, but I'm going to transform what you do. I'm going to transform your purpose. And yet here they are going back to what they knew because it was familiar and they're empty handed. And Jesus just hits them with, how's that working out for you? How's that going? By the way, if somebody ever asks you, how's that working out for you? Don't answer. (laughs) They already know. It's just their kind of nice way of telling you you're an idiot, but they kind of want you to figure it out on your own. But they already got it figured out. So instead, try to glean what they're trying to get across. Just a free life tip for you this morning. Now Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. Professional fishermen, out all night. Like that net hasn't been around every square inch of that boat. Their nets are empty. Cast on the other side. I am not a, a big fisherman. I used to go with my grandfather when I was younger. He would take me on Saturday. His brother had some property on a lake and it had a couple docks. And we would go up there and we would go fishing. And we would sit in lawn chairs. And this was before the days of iPods or and anything else really I mean some people had Walkmans but they were bulky and they were big and they'd suck the batteries dry just instantaneously um, but but this was really before even those so we would we would go fishing and if I was catching something it was fun uh, but this was before the time that I'd figured out that the real purpose of fishing is just to go so you don't have to do the honey-do list or talk to anybody. You went fishing, not really to catch fish, but just for the silence. And so I would, I would try to have conversation with my grandfather. He'd be like, you don't talk while you fish, grandson. You just, you just fish. I'm like, all right. And then like 30 minutes into it, if I haven't caught anything, I'm like, it's, let's go. We're ready to go. It's like, it's not time. It's not time. On this side of my life, I completely understand why it's not time 30 minutes in when you have 30 minutes of silence but at that point in my life I didn't understand that and he was just reeling in fish one day and I had nothing he was like cast your line over here this is where the fish are biting now again we're on separate docks and he says cast your line over here this is where the fish are by. So I bring my, I don't even know the terms. I, I bring the line in, whatever's on the end, one of the bobbers or hooks or whatever things. Bring that in. I squeeze the little trigger on the, the fishing pole. And I cast right in his direction. And the line goes over his head. <laughs> and he looked over at me. And they look back at the water. And I can still see this when I close my eyes. He went like this. And he said, you've tangled our lines. And I said, well, you told me to cast over there. He said, I meant walk over here and cast over there. And then he got frustrated because our lines were so tangled and he had to cut them and we didn't have enough things in the tackle box so we got to leave early that day and get ice cream. Now, (laughs) so everyone wins, right? (laughs) So, So if you've ever been there, you know that feeling. That if you're not just out there for the solitude You want to have something to show. You want the fish to be biting. And if you're a professional, you can't afford to come back with an empty boat.
They've been out all night. And here's somebody standing on the beach that says, try it on the other side of the boat. You'll find some fish. I would have loved to have heard the conversation on the boat. Like, oh, that's great, great advice. Like we didn't think of that. Try on the right side of the boat. So they cast it on the other side. They throw the net. Maybe it was just, uh, maybe it was, they were just desperate. Maybe it was just to get the person on the shore to shut up when they said, we've got nothing here either. I don't know the reason, but here's what I know, because they don't know it's Jesus yet. They're not doing this because they're like, well, if you go fishing with Jesus and Jesus says to put your net on the right side, obviously you're going to put your net on the right side of the boat. They don't know it's Jesus yet. They cast the net on the right side of the boat, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Now, I'm never going fishing with the disciples, first of all. That's just awkward. I don't know how you like to go fishing, but if you ever invite me fishing, let's just make sure we keep our clothes on the whole time, okay? Great. Now that we've got that ground rule established, we'll consider going fishing together. But there's Peter, and for some reason, he doesn't have all his clothes on. And so when when John figures out it's Jesus, Peter puts on his clothes, and he's making a beeline. Go have an encounter with Jesus. And yet there's some truths here that we need to understand. The first is this. Sometimes in life, we're out in the boat for a really long time, doing what we know how to do, doing what we should be able and capable to do in and of ourselves, and it's just not working. And sometimes, that's because God has something he wants us to learn. And he's just waiting for the right moment to reveal that to us. It's not like the disciples didn't know how to fish. It's just God was going to use this to accomplish something greater in their life. And if you are in a season right now where you are just up against it, and it seems like what you know and what you've done before right now cannot be accomplished, and you're just hitting a roadblock after a roadblock after a roadblock, it may very well be that God is getting you ready to teach you something. That will change you. Sometimes in life, we come up to a ton of roadblocks and we think to ourselves, we should be able and we should be competent enough to figure this out and to achieve this and accomplish this on our own. And yet the reason that we aren't is we aren't doing it God's way. Make sure in your life That you're willing to listen to the way that God calls us to do things. As soon as the disciples listened, there were so many fish, they were overwhelmed. The other disciples came in the boat. Peter was swimming. He was so excited that it was Jesus. As soon as he puts his clothes back on, he starts swimming. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place. 
with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn gone to empty from empty to overflowing the net is full of fish jesus is is on the beach waiting for them he is cooking they have 153 fish in their nets and jesus said to them come and have breakfast now none of the disciples dared ask him who are you they knew it was the lord jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. You may give up on God. You may, in a season of frustration, in a time where things are just not going according to the way that you think they should go, when your plans aren't being achieved in the way that you want them to be, out of frustration, out of your thought that you know better for your own life than the way that God has called you to, and so you refuse to surrender and you're just going to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, you may run from God. You may be in this position where the disciples say, forget it, we're going back to the life we knew. We don't even fully fathom all that we've encountered yet, but we are returning to what we know. You may run from God, but understand this, God will pursue you. And know this, if you've run, God's waiting on a beach. And he's cooked you breakfast. His love for you is not diminished. You can write off God, but God will not write you off. And there he is. The disciples who've thrown in the towel and said, we're going back to the life we knew. And Jesus says, Let's eat breakfast together. I've made you food. So they sit down and they eat. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Jesus asked him three times. We can't escape the fact that on the night Jesus was arrested, Peter sat around a fire. A teenager looked over at him at one point. Questioned, weren't you with Jesus? And three times, Peter denied knowing Jesus. Hours later, of course, Jesus would be crucified. And yet here we are weeks later. Conversation between Jesus and Peter. 
where Jesus puts the failure right on the table. And it just questions, do you love me? And when Peter answers in the affirmative, when Peter says, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. All three times, Jesus gives Peter the same indicator for how he'll know and what he needs to do. Do you love me? And if the answer is yes, go serve others. This is the indicator of whether or not we love. When Jesus has this conversation with Peter, and when he asks him, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. What does Jesus say every time? He says, go serve others. God has given us all a purpose. God has given us all talents. God has given us all gifts and abilities. And the way that we reveal our love for God is we serve others. If we love God, we must serve. It's that simple. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to Peter, follow me. Peter, I believe you love me. And you need to know that the path of following me will not always be easy. In fact, for you, it's going to end horribly. Still, follow me. Let's just be honest. Following Jesus won't always be easy. It's not. There are times that following Jesus restricts us from doing things we want to do. There are times that following Jesus means we have to respond in love when it'd be a lot more fun to punch somebody. There are times when following Jesus will cost us. It won't always be easy. But it will, without question, always be worth it. We've seen Jesus do the miraculous. As he walked on water. And as Peter got out of the boat and started to walk on water. And then had moments of doubt and started to stumble. And we saw Jesus instantaneously pick him up and save him. We saw Jesus teaching in a house that was overflowing because so many people came to hear what Jesus had to say. They wanted a glimpse of all that was going on. And we're introduced to a man who's paralyzed and whose friends are carrying him. And they get to the scene and the house is overflowing. And yet they will not be denied. Because they believe Jesus can do the miraculous. So they climb up to the ceiling 
to the roof of that house. They bust a hole into it and they lower the paralyzed man down before Jesus. And Jesus heals him. I've seen the disciples in a room. Unsure of their future. Jesus appears. And then we've seen one of the disciples who wasn't there at the time tell the others, until I touch the wounds, I won't believe it. And Jesus says, here you go. And we've seen those disciples return to their former life. And we've seen Jesus pursue them, restore them, and give them a job to do, to serve others. When we follow Jesus, there will be times where we will have faith. We just feel like nothing can stop us. And we'll be willing to get out of the boat. And there will be times when we follow Jesus that our faith is shaken. And we start to sink. There will be times when we follow Jesus that we can carry others. And there will be times when we follow Jesus that we need good people around us to carry us because we just can't take another step. There will be times when we follow Jesus where not everything makes sense. And there will be times when we follow Jesus that God reveals something to us and we go and we share it with other people. There will be times when we follow Jesus that doubt will creep into our minds and yet God is never frightened by that doubt. God is never scared off by it and God will reveal himself to us each and every time if we only ask him to. And there will be times when we follow Jesus. That our nets are empty. And we fail. There will be times when we follow Jesus that Jesus says, slide your net over here. Swim up to shore. I see your failures. I see your mistakes. I see your regrets. Sit down and let's have breakfast. Because I love you anyway. The question is, do you love me? And if the answer is yes, then we serve. We serve others. And we love in the way that Jesus loved us. God, I pray that we would understand the most rewarding life is a life that is following you. It does not mean it's the easiest. Yet every time, God, it is the most rewarding. Give us faith. Help us believe. Help us carry others when they have just reached the end and they can't take one more step. As a community, help us carry them. And God, help us be people who have a community around us that when we are exhausted, when we can't take another step, that people would carry us. God, that we would be honest with our doubts and we would just say, here they are, God. And that you would reveal yourself to us in ways that we just can't explain other than that is God. 
And God, that when we're empty, and when we failed, we're willing to listen. And we return to you. That we would prove our love for you by our desire to serve one another and our desire to love the world in the way that you loved us. So that God, when people look at us by our words, by our deeds, by our love, they would not see us, but they would see you. That is our prayer, that people look at us and they see Jesus. It's in his name we pray.